Hi, everybody. I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so I think I'm going to start with a little exercise. This, this, I hope the group is interactive. <laughs> um, and I want you guys to think of a either a, a concept that you try to teach your students, um, either like an intellectual concept or just an, uh, some sort of value, you know, an emotional value that you try to transmit that you struggle to transmit. You know, the students struggle to process it. They struggle to understand it. It was too, you know, counterintuitive for them. Um, whether it's an intellectual idea or an emotional, you know, value that you're trying to transmit, it could be this gosh, to the Rebbe. It could be understanding a complex Rashi Sikha, whatever it is, right? Um, if you could also write it in the chat, that would be ideal. Um, so we just got some things in here. You don't have to, but if a few people can try to write something in, that would be great just to have some examples. Again, something which, um, you try to transmit to your students, whether it's an intellectual idea or, you know, some sort of emotional concept or value um, that you struggle to do so. Um, your students weren't receptive to that. Connecting to the words of tefillah. Nice. Nice. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I think I have a hard time being uh, fully embracing that. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, yes. Um, I'm curious to actually hear more about that. If you mean specifically that it's associated with Hasidishkeit, that it's part of the definition of a chaser or just the idea of being organized in general. Um, that's interesting. Um, respecting another person, like one person to talk at a time and listen. Mm. Both. Okay, nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, anybody else? Uh, some of the punishments in the Torah. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. That's a very good one. Yes, <laughs> hard to wrap our heads around that in like the modern age. Totally. Um, okay, I'll wait like another minute in case anybody else has some ideas. Like I, I really feel like I mean, with like like it is with any sort of you know workshop or whatever. Like unless you have real examples, it's hard to really like bring the idea to life and like see what it actually means. So that's why I feel like the more examples we can give, the the more we can actually get like a a practical sense of, of um, what we're going to be talking about. Um, anything else? I guess you guys are all such good educators that you just don't struggle at all with transmitting things to your students. Awesome. Okay. I mean, I know for myself, I mean, there's lots of things um, that I struggle to give over or my students just don't seem to get. Oh, respecting other teachers, even if they, even if they don't like the subject. Okay. That's good. Yeah. 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 Um, having respect. Okay. Nice. Very nice. So, um, I want to bring up an idea. This is an idea that I've, that I guess, has really resonated with me in many different contexts. Um, and it's an idea that I've learned in a few different places. Um, one of them in the context of a mime about Pesach. Um, and it's this idea that anytime we want to move somebody from one place to another, intellectually, emotionally, um, there's always something that has to happen in between. Um, Respect and connecting to okay, those are a lot. Uh, it seems like a lot of people have, we have similar themes here. We have respect, it's Fido seems to be a big one. Yeah, those are all big ones that I think we all sort of struggle to get our students to resonate with. Yeah. Um, so anytime we're moving from one state to another, there always has to be something that happens in between, okay? Um, and I'll give you an example, just a practical example in like social interactions. So you're having a conversation with someone and you're talking to them, you're trying to describe something to them. And as you're talking to them, you can tell they don't really understand what you're saying, right? Like from the way they're responding, they don't really get it, right? And what you could see is that they already have a preconceived notion of who you are and the way you might think about something. And like everything you're saying, they're trying to like fit back into that preconceived notion of who you are and how you might feel or whatever it is, right? Especially if you're having like a very emotionally charged conversation, that can happen a lot. Like you're having like an argument about something or whatever it is, right? So like if either side isn't really open to the other person, right? So then like you already hanging on to like, oh, I know what they're gonna say already, right? And so like, you're not actually open to the other person, right? And we've been probably been both on the receiving end of this and on the giving end of this, right? Where you feel like the other person isn't really like open to what you're saying because they have a preconceived notion of you. And we've probably also been on the other end of it where, you know, we're kind of looking at someone else sort of cynically being like, oh, I know what they're gonna say, you know? And you're just kind of, everything they're saying, you're just kind of fitting back into a preconceived notion about them right? Um, so anytime we want to like really be open to something new, the first step is always letting go of what we already have, right? What preconceived notions we already have. And in the language of Hasidus, like the, the sort of the visual analogy that Hasidus gives is like when you have a seed, right? So a seed is this, you know, this dry, tiny, dry little 
object, right? That has absolutely no resemblance to a tree and to the very delicious, um, colorful fruit that are eventually going to be grown out of that tree, right? And how does that seed go from being a seed and turn into this beautiful, fruitful tree? And the first step of that process, obviously there's a lot of stages of growth and development, right? But before we get to all those stages of growth and development, the first step is that the seed goes into the ground and it disintegrates, it completely falls apart, right? And because the seed can't become a tree unless it stops being a seed, right? The first step is you need to stop being a seed if you ever want to become a tree, right? Um, the, the other example given is the example of um, Rob Zera, right? That he had to fast a hundred fasts, right? When he traveled from, um, Babel to Eretz Yisrael, right, in order to understand the Torah of Eretz Yisrael, which was on such a dramatically deeper level than the Torah that he had learned, he had to fast, right, and again, obviously we don't mean like, the idea being that it's not that he was literally forgetting everything, but he had to forget in the sense that like, he had to sort of let go of the whole framework of the way he understood Torah before, if he wanted to be open and like truly receptive to the Torah he was going to be learning, right. So we have this, uh, this idea that from one yesh to another yesh, there always has to be an ayin, right? You need to have this, this state of ayin, this state of disintegration, <laughs> right? The state of nothingness in between before you can enter this new state, this new reality, this new um, right, way of thinking, way of understanding, way of being, right? Um, and there's this beautiful mimer that I learned probably like 10 years ago <laughs> and stuck with me. Um, and it talks about, this is really what Yitzhak Mitzrayim is all about, right? On a spiritual level, right? We know there's lots of like spiritual symbolisms to Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Um, but one of them, again, according to Chassidus, when we're talking about it on a more kind of psychological, emotional, spiritual level, is that, you know, um, uh, Pare is from the same uh, letters as Aref. Um, and Aref is the neck. And in our bodies, right, we have our head, and then there's sort of this very narrow space, which is our neck, and then it gets wider again, and that's where our heart is, right? So we sort of have our brain, we have this narrow space, and then the heart. And according to Chassidus, there's this idea that the neck is like the Mitzrayim. It's like this very narrow space that exists between our mind and our heart. And um, that narrow space sort of represents, like, psychologically, right, that we, we have that Anytime we're processing a new idea, right? We have to understand it intellectually. And then there's sort of this Mitzrayim, there's like this narrow space, this like, we have to sort of like let go of our intellectual understanding of it if we want to allow our ourselves to have an emotional reaction. Um, and that sort of that state of I, that state of like sort of like letting go of that intellectualism for a minute in order to allow for the emotions to process, that's what Yitzhak Mitzrayim is about. It's all about um, going through that process of ayin, right? Of like sort of like, uh, letting go of something in order to allow for a new thing to emerge. Um, so, so we kind of, we see this idea again, it's just trying really represents this whole idea of letting go in order to allow for something new to come into you, right? Um, and I think when we're talking about educating, and we'll talk about this both when it comes to intellectual ideas and when it comes to just emotional growth in general, there's always something that we need to let go of or always something our students need to let go of. And if they're not processing something or they're not um, receptive to something, right? Or like no matter how many times we explain this idea in so many creative ways, right? It's just not penetrating. There's always something that they're not letting go of, right? And sometimes the first step is to try to figure out is what do they need to let go of? in order to be able to be open to this new idea. Like what are the, what perception are they hanging on to? Whether it's a perception of an idea, right? So if someone spoke about punishments and Tyra, right? So like, usually why do we have this, why do students have this very like negative or like um, sort of punitive association with like Tyra or even Hashem? Like I find this with people's picture of Hashem a lot, right? You talk to a student and they'll be asking you questions and you can see from their questions, they won't verbalize this, but you can see from their questions, they have a picture of Hashem as being this like evil controlling dictator who's like trying to control their life, right? They don't say it in those words because they wouldn't say that, right? But like the way they're asking questions about Tyra and about mitzvahs and about why do I have to do this? Why? Like you could see that that's their picture. And like before you talk about anything else, they need to let go of that picture of Hashem, right? Um, so again, I don't know, when it comes to punishments of Tyra, that that's, could be an example of that type of thing where like they have a certain picture of what Tyra is, right? And everything that you're saying about 
what the Torah says about reward, right? It's all fitting into that picture they already have. And until they let go of that picture, like nothing you say is really going to help, right? Because they're all just fitting it back into this like very, you know, sort of tit for tat reward and punishment type of picture of Yiddishkeit, right? And like sometimes we need to like just identify like what's that picture that they have that needs to be, that they need to let go of before we can introduce a new idea here, right? Um, that's one example. And then even when it comes to things like, you know, people spoke about developing respect, developing, um, you know, connecting to words of tefillah, right? Um, again, connecting to words of tefillah can be sometimes an intellectual thing, sometimes an emotional thing, depending, you know? Um, but I feel like even when it comes to things like that, things about like developing their character, it's the same thing, essentially, right? Where you're, there's a picture of yourself that you need to let go of, right? Like they see themselves a certain way, right? Whether it's like, oh, like taking my dominant seriously is like weird or like nerdy, right? Or like whatever it is, right? They have some sort of perception or like, that's not my type of thing to do because I'm whatever, right? Like they have a certain picture of themselves and how they identify themselves, right? What's my identity? Um, and sometimes like in order for them to really grow, they need to let go of a certain identity or a certain association, right? In order for them to be open to the idea of like, oh, like to feel like something I can connect to or like, oh, like respecting teachers is like a cool thing. That's like a thing that like mature, you know, people do, which I, I, and I can like, I can like associate myself with those types of people who are like mature, respectful people, right? Like a lot of times it just has to do with the way, you know, letting go of a certain self-perception. Um, so just to connect is also, there's a really powerful sikha. I feel, you know, I was gonna start with the sikha and then I was like, you know what? I feel like everyone here probably knows the sikha because like all you, these machan guys, they probably like know the look of the by heart. Um, anyway, but this is a, it's a, it's like a common one, but I think it really like, it, um, it's also one of my favorites, something I, I really feel like really captures a lot of what education is about, where the Sikha talks about the three names of Pesach. Um, you know, we have Chag HaMatzai, Zaman Chirusenu, um, and Pesach, right? Chag Pesach, right? And those are, those are used in different contexts. Um, we have the Torah itself, um, uses Chag Hamatzis, right? In the language of Chazal, Chazal is the, are the ones who first introduced the concept, the, the term Zaman Ferisenu. And then Chag Pesach, that's sort of what we use colloquially, right? Like no one, that's what everyone calls it, which is not called, it's the word Chag Pesach has never appears anywhere in the Torah or in Chazal, right? We just kind of use that. Um, so we kind of see like, even like um, historically, the name has changed over time. And the Rebbe actually says that the fact that that's, that's chronologically it happened that way actually tells us something about how these three names actually represent three stages um and what Pesach's all about um so not to get into too much detail but the the sikh is basically sort of goes for these three stages it, it talks about it both in terms of intellect into understanding a new idea like uh encountering a new intellectual idea and then it sort of parallels that with the journey the jewish people went on and i like to kind of connect that also to just any sort of change or transformation that any of us want to embark on and i think this is especially important when we're talking about chinuch, which again, chinuch is not really not just an academic thing. It's really about helping our students develop their character, right? Develop into more refined, um, focused, purposeful people, right? Um, so I feel like this idea is really powerful for that as well. And and what this sikha says is that chag hamatzis, right? Matzah is all about bittel, right? Matzah represents bittel. It's flat. It doesn't rise. Um, there's no ego, right, associated with matzah. So that's sort of like that first stage of any of any sort of growth, right? Whether it's intellectual growth, whether it's emotional growth, the first stage is always bittel. Bittel meaning I have to like put myself aside for a minute in order to be open to something new, right? If I want to have a conversation with someone and I want to like really actually hear them, I need to put aside whatever preconceived notions I have, right? If I'm sitting in a classroom and I actually want to understand a new idea, like I need to let go of whatever ideas I already have about that idea. Um, that's the first stage, right? And same thing with growth, right? If I'm growing in a certain area, my first stage of growth is always like, I need to let go of a certain perception of myself, right? A certain, something about myself that I feel really like I, I, I'm hanging on to, right? Something, I need to let go of something, right? The second stage is Zman Kherasinu. Zman Kherasinu is all about freedom, right? The time of our freedom. Um, and what, what's true freedom, right? What does true freedom really mean? True freedom really means um, living aligned with, um, you know, living on with who you truly are, right? Not, again, not, um, not necessarily doing whatever you want, right? But 
finding what's what you truly want, right? That you, what your true self is and, and living aligned with that. So that's sort of the second stage of learning or the second stage of development is taking that, once you've like let go of your pre old preconceived notions and you sort of been open to something new, now you can take that idea um, and sort of sort of start integrating it into who you are, right? So if it's, if it's an idea, right? It's like, okay, now this is a process of actually analyzing, understanding, trying to work with the idea and actually make it something that I can process, right? Now's the time to bring myself back into the picture and try to see how I can integrate this with who I am, um, right? Or even if you're going through an emotional, uh, you know, sort of a character development uh, sort of process, you know, the first stage is always sort of putting yourself aside, you know, putting aside what you want, putting aside what you, the way you see yourself. But the second stage is saying like, wait, how can I actually work on myself to like align myself with this new self that I want to become? Um, and then finally, the final stage is Pesach, right? Pesach means to leap, to jump over, right? That's when like we actually become a new person, right? That's like the final stage of like, when you've actually achieved that transformation, like I've now become something new. I've taken that leap and whether it's intellectually, I have a, like I actually have a new way of understanding something or whether it's, you know, emotionally right now, like I've, I've actually changed who I am in a certain way. I've gone through a real process um, of actual transformation. So that's kind of like the three stages that the Rebbe outlines there. And I think this is so, yeah, I think it's just a really powerful thing when we're, we're trying to approach a student and try to get a new idea across, something that's hard for them to resonate with. Um, and I think like always the first stage is always what, what do they need to let go of, right? What, preconceived notion are they hanging on to that's not allowing them to to process this new idea to um integrate with it right there's something that's blocking them from even allowing it into themselves right and that's sort of like it's something we need to think about before we even start figuring out how to teach the idea right it's like the prerequisite for starting to like teach and explain it is just like what's in the way of allowing them to even be open to that experience to begin with um just one more thing that I want to bring up um, is, you know, I've been talking about this in terms of our students going through this process of I in, right? Like letting go of whatever they have in order to be open to something new. But I also think it works the other way. Um, and this is something I think about a lot when we approach our students. We also have preconceived notions about our students, right? Like we often approach our students with a certain picture of who they are especially if you live in a community where you might know their families, you might know their background, you might know like even their, like who they've been through the last, you know, I don't know, five years of their schooling, like what they've been through, right? And all those things build up a certain picture of who our students are. Um, and sometimes we have to realize the same way our students have a certain picture of us or of Yiddishkeit or of the Tyra or of Hashem or whoever it is that gets in the way of them being receptive to us, the same thing happens the other way is that we often have a certain picture of our students that gets in the way of us being open to them and who they really are. And I think if we ourselves can also go through that exercise of like letting go, right? Like, let me look at my student in the eye and like, let go of this, this, this preconceived notion that I have of them, right? It's like, you know, that student when they raise their hand, like internally you're rolling your eyes. Cause you're like, I know what they're going to ask already. You know, like, oh, they're going to ask that annoying question again. Like they're like, you know what they're going to say. Right. And like, and sometimes it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because we're always expecting them to be a certain person. Um, and, and sometimes when we do that, we don't allow them to be somebody different because we're always putting them back into this box. And if we can like let go of that for a minute and say like, oh, let me like, let me, let me let go of this notion that I have of this, the student. And again, of course, there's value to having information about a student, knowing their background, knowing what kind of stress they're going through. It obviously you know, gives us a certain sensitivity to who they are and, you know, how to, how to deal with them and all that. And all that definitely has value. But I think there's also a lot of value um, in any relationship and for sure with a student to being able to just to let them surprise us, you know, like give them the space to surprise you, to be someone new, to be someone different, right? Allow them to like, like give them the, the, the freedom to change, right? Like I think often the people in our lives, like, we don't let them change. We want them to change and we don't let them change because we're just expecting them to be the same, right? And sometimes it's like, well, maybe I could be different if you weren't always expecting me to be the same. Um, you know, like I feel like a lot, a lot of us may have had this experience where you move to a new place or to a new school and all of a sudden you like, 
kind of become a different person like you're, you're kind of like find that you feel more free to like express other parts of yourself that you couldn't before um and a lot of that has to do with the fact that like these people don't have any preconceived notions about you so you could be whoever you want you know like it's no like i don't, I don't have to live up to anyone's expectations i could just be anything right and there's something very freeing about that um and i think it's it's it's, there's a lot of value to being able to give our students that freedom, right? That ability to like just surprise us, be someone different, right? We don't have to always expect them to be the same. We can allow, we can give them the space and the platform to change and to transform. Um, so that's my, that's my thoughts about Pesach and how it connects